Neil, over to you. Uh, thanks, David. Um, as, as the title says, we're going to have a look at uh, deep water around the world, and it's going to be a, a 20 minute across the planet uh, view of what's happening in 2010 and what to look out for. But also, uh, David thought it was um, apt to uh, also mention the implications of what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico um, in terms of uh, deep water exploration. And I think uh, that we've got a bunch of slides at the back on this because I think it is important. Um, on a daily basis now, we're getting um, uh, contacted by various political bodies uh, within the US uh, administration to actually go through uh, views on what to do next and what are the issues and what needs to be done uh, in terms of deep water in the US. But I also think it's got major implications in terms of what comes out of the, the current spill uh, for deep water globally and also world oil supply and demand. So we'll, we'll end uh, with that. Um, what I'd like to do is walk through, first of all, what's been happening from a 50,000 foot view on uh, the deep water world, uh, looking very much uh, from the way we look at it, and I, I'm saying that from a sort of city Wall Street point of view, in terms of the companies that are involved um, in the deep water, um, looking at where their strategies are today, how they've evolved, and going forward, uh, looking at the particular areas they're going to be involved in um, in 2010 and 11. Uh, then, as I mentioned, we'll go on and, and look at really uh, uh, discussing what's happening with uh, the, the Deepwater Gulf of Mexico spill, not in terms of the day-to-day -day activities um, of, of BP and what they're up to. You can read about that at item in, in the, the press, uh, but more our views on what it's going to do uh, for policy going forward. So first of all, um, just having a look at uh, who's been finding what uh, over the last few years. Uh, what we've done here is broken down uh, the discoveries. And this is done not in terms of size of discoveries, just number of discoveries uh, over the last few years. And I think this is quite important because, as David has mentioned, um, I, I think we, we held a very similar view to David um, uh, pre-2006, that a lot of the deep water um, exploration um, seemed to be running its course. If you looked at the creaming curves in the Gulf of Mexico, in Angola, uh, in Nigeria, and other places, the creaming curves all suggested that uh, the reserves were getting much smaller and much deeper, and these basins were, were running out of discoveries. Um, from 2005 to where we are today, it's been very clear that the companies that have been the most successful in deep water exploration have either been NOCs or have been um, uh, the smaller ENPs and not really uh, the major integrated oil companies. And actually what you're starting to see in the major integrated oil companies is that they're picking up the pace of exploration or at least talking about this as they feel they've been left behind. So if you look at the number of, uh, of discoveries, the IOCs at the bottom being effectively the integrated oil companies, have found a fraction of the discoveries in the last few years relative to the ENP companies and relative to uh, the NOCs. And the NOCs in particular um, have been heavily influenced by what's been going on um, in Brazil, uh, which has seen the, the uh, I suppose, the Mueller load of the, um, of the deep water finds in the last few years. Um, there we go. Um, however, it's not been exclusively Brazil uh, or uh, Ghana. Um, there have been discoveries, and this is both on and offshore, right across the world. Um, Australia, for example, uh, especially offshore Australia, has seen a massive amount of, um, uh, of discoveries, a lot of which aren't even classed anywhere close to uh, being in deep water. And that does take me on to a slight segue, which is what is deep water? And I'm sure, I hope somebody else will uh, discuss this, because there, there doesn't seem to be any real strict definition of what is deep water anymore, because deep water changes every single year. Uh, you'll see some of our charts, we look at fields that have been discovered uh, in over 200 meters of water depth. Um, going forward, uh, you'll see at the end of the presentation, when we look at future fields coming on in the deep water, we look at fields over 1,000 meters um, in terms of water depth. Um, although you could even argue that we need to go out another level uh, still. 
Um, so I think what, what we've started to see across the, the, the world over the last few years is a plethora of different exploration activities, some of which are in the deep water, but very much you've seen a renaissance of onshore, shallow water, and many uh, locations as well. And uh, w what's been interesting for us is it's not really been driven by the integrated oil companies, it's been driven by NOCs uh, and the ENPs. If you look specifically at deep water, now, to go way back in time, we've used a 200-meter cutoff mark. Um, and as I said, it has moved very much o over time. And today, really, you're talking about things way beyond 1,000 meters uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of water depths to even get it classed within deep water. And many people would even say 1,000 meters is far too shallow. Um, it's been interesting in terms of when people have actually discovered deep water plays. I don't actually think there's much correlation with the oil price at all. So it, it's not been something that's been driven by uh, the cost of going out and, and finding things. It's really been uh, driven by the availability of opportunities and new technology. Um, so if you look, let's see if my pointer works, there we go. If you look at what happened, uh, and this is mainly Gulf of Mexico stuff that happened in, in the late 1980s as, as Shell, amongst others, really discovered uh, uh, the, the, the trends in submarine fans and, and classic reservoirs in the deep water. Um, and that sort of was the first wave. The second wave was very much Gulf of Mexico again, but Angola, Nigeria, uh, and, and so on um, in the, the mid to late uh, 1990s, when, as we all know, oil prices uh, were extremely low. So really, it had nothing to do with um, oil prices at that point. It was the opening up of new areas because of new technology. Then interestingly, as the oil price started to climb, we actually had a massive drop in, in uh, deep water discoveries. And I think this is largely due to the fact that the integrated oil companies stopped exploring. Now, many in the room would, you know, may disagree with that statement, but I've used it many times. But I think once you get beyond 2002, it's actually quite difficult to name the discoveries that the integrated oil companies have actually made. Um, like you're, you're talking, you can do it pretty much on, on your hands uh, for, for the major uh, discoveries. And this last wave, which has correlated reasonably well with the oil price, although I think that's nothing to do with the oil price, it's more to do with who's been discovering the oil and gas, this has been driven very much by Brazil and very much by ENP companies, both in the Gulf of Mexico and, as David said, in places like the new West Africa. So uh, to me, it, it's, it's a lot to do. These phases of deep water are not oil price driven as such. They're more um, technology driven. At least that was the case in the late 80s and, and maybe the late 90s, and more so uh, an understanding of geology, which has changed. The other interesting point in the deep water is, uh, and you've probably seen these sort of slides before, that apart from the latest discoveries in Brazil, which are up here, the trend has been very much smaller and smaller fields, and it's been deeper and deeper water depths. Um, wh what we've also seen is that the flow rates have changed as well. So if you look at the last cluster of decent-sized fields, which were in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, you were seeing reasonably-sized fields. They started to go into deeper and deeper water with flow rates that could range from 55,000 barrels of oil a day at, at Thunder Horse down to the sort of 15 to 20,000 barrels a day in places like Angola. Um, today, apart from Brazil, and again, we'll, if we leave Brazil out of it, flow rates in the Gulf of Mexico for the lower tertiary, like you're lucky to get anywhere around 10,000 barrels of oil a day, at best 15,000 barrels, which it was... Uh, uh, which looks like one of Anadarko's wells and, and, and one of uh, Chevron's uh, wells uh, can achieve that sort of level. And I think this is going to be incredibly important going forward, that outside Brazil, there is a trend towards very much more technically challenged geology, um, whereas Brazil, the geology is a bit more simpler in the fact that the reservoir rocks um, are, are there. They're, they're not really well understood, but the flow rates seem to be um, uh, reasonably high. We think the average in Brazil in the pre-salt is going to be in the 20 to 25,000 barrel a day level in terms of flow rates, which is well above what we had expected two years ago, and I think what the oil companies had expected from carbonate reservoirs. Um, so wh where are people going, and uh, what are the hot areas for this year and next? Um, this is a chart we've done, might be quite difficult to read, um, and we've got the companies 
uh, in terms of the integrated oil companies on the left-hand side, and uh, the deep water uh, parts of the world that some are targeting in these um, pinky boxes. Um, what's interesting is that if you go right back to the, the late 80s and um, even the mid 90s, deep water exploration was pretty much everything the integrated oil companies were doing. That they took on the risk, they didn't mind going <laughs> after things that, that were um, seen as being uh, quite technical. Um, whereas today, they're very much balancing the risk of doing a little bit in the deep water and doing lots and lots of easy, unconventional stuff where the geological risk is pretty much uh, zero. Um, so what, uh, just to show this point, you'll see that some are in Brazil and trying to get into Brazil. Some are in Ghana. A lot have got into Indonesia. Um, Arctic, I've, I've not classified so much as deep water as it's a mixture of deep water and moderate uh, scale water. But again, in the Gulf of Mexico, a bit offshore Libya. And then you've got this whole plethora of, of, of deep water or, or of exploration hotspots where they're seen as a lot lower risk, especially if you look at unconventional, if you look at Iraq. Um, it's risky from a political point of view, but not much risk from a geological point of view. Um, and they've, I think, lost their risk appetite. Um, and this could change over the next few years um, as they get pushed into going into more and more exploration um, areas. And I think we could see the next renaissance of exploration activity over the next five years, where the integrated decide to take on risk again, because the market Wall Street and the city is not rewarding them for going after the easy stuff. Because I think a lot of investors are sitting there saying, well, you know, what is your value added to developing this stuff on behalf of somebody else? And it really isn't much. And that's why I think the three simple rules of, of uh, oil companies in the market, if, if the oil company works in terms of the market, they have to have high production growth, which is profitable, which does not include Iraq. They need to be exploring and have the potential for a significant added value from exploration acreage for the company. And lastly, they need leverage to oil and gas prices. And most of the integrated oil companies don't tick any of those three uh, boxes. Um, so if we move on to exactly where people are targeting, up to around about 2005, 2006, there was a pretty good idea of what the deep water meant from a geological uh, perspective. Um, very much people chasing submarine fans, plastic reservoirs. And I think then there was a big change that a lot of the oil companies, especially the integrated ones, took this model and said we have to chase, chase current drainage systems. And that's where we're going to find um, our oil and gas. So they, they targeted Angola, Nigeria, Gulf of Mexico as being the, the, the main drivers. Whenever you, you take a step back from that, it's been the guys that have gone out and looked for something that's quite different uh, that have made success in the last few years. So you could argue the future is all about stratigraphic traps and it is all about pre-salt carbonate reservoirs. Sure, there will be quite a lot of submarine fan discoveries, but in terms of ch chasing after the main drainage systems in the world, most of us could actually do that with a simple map. Um, going to the next stage, I think it's going to get a bit more complex, but it does open up a lot of new areas. First of all, when you go and look at West Africa, uh, West Africa, the, the uh, classic sort of submarine fan, chased the, the, the drainage system, and that worked extremely well if you look in the mid-90s, especially in Angola and Nigeria. This is the creaming curve of, of reserves discovered. Um, fantastic. <coughs> Uh, uh, fantastic progression until we get to the last few years. So from 2005 to 2009, this does not include Ghana uh, in this chart. And you can start to see that it, it's starting to, to, to swing over. It, it's not looking as good anymore, largely because everything that's been discovered in Angola has been much smaller than what was discovered in the mid-90s. Mid and a lot of it has been discovered in the ultra-deep um, uh, water as well. Nigeria, because of lots of worries about the political situation and changes to the oil law, has seen pretty much a, a virtual stalling of any decent exploration activity in the deep water of Nigeria. And that has resulted um, in, in the, this creaming curve starting to roll over a bit. If you look exclusively sort of uh, in the, uh, the Congo Zaire type basins. 
However, you move further along the coast uh, and go into uh, West Africa, this is a, a snapshot of all the exploration wells that were drilled in West Africa from 1965 to 2005. And you can see the progression here in different time slices out and out and out to the deeper and deeper and deeper water um, in, in Nigeria, but really nothing happening here beyond 200 meters along the coast. It's quite interesting that in the last few years, all the activity has been along these two areas and will continue to be in 2010 and 11. And I, I think until we see a clear hydrocarbon law in Nigeria, and until people feel a bit more comfortable uh, about the situation, Nigeria exploration and the traditional West African exploration is pretty much, um, pretty much dead. A Little bit more going on in Angola, also in Southern Angola for the pre-salt, but this is where all the activity is gonna take place. Uh, indeed, if you move further and further to the, the west, uh, there are two very important wells going down uh, this year in Sierra Leone in Liberia. <laughs> Um, Anadarko and, um, and Tolo uh, uh, drilling those wells. This, these follow on from what Anadarko would claim is a very successful test of a hydrocarbon system in the Venus uh, well that was drilled last year uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, albeit not a commercial discovery from what we can tell, it's given indications for them to go off and drill uh, uh, nearby and, and, and potentially prove up a new system. Uh, there's also a well going down in Liberia. I think it's in the, in the fourth quarter. We'll find out more about that. And also, even back in Ghana itself, um, Hess will be drilling just south of the Jubilee field um, in the second half of the year. Uh, in a 100% owned block, um, we'll, one will see if uh, the, deep, the deeper, deeper water uh, offshore Ghana can prove up um, uh, hydrocarbon plays. So this is extremely active in 2010 and 2011. It's actually leading to, as you, as you will probably know, with, with Cosmos in Ghana, it's leading to M&A activity or uh, deal activity as well uh, here. So expect a lot more um, uh, from this area in terms of industry and use flow over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. If we move uh, to another part of the world across the Atlantic, the other big surprise I think the industry has seen is uh, the, uh, the, the sort of new type of uh, deep water reservoirs, um, not deposited in deep water initially, uh, deposit, deposited very much in, in, in shallow water in most cases, but it's carbonate reservoirs. Now th this presents more a engineering challenge than a geological challenge, because it's not so much understanding where the reservoirs are and the right places uh, to drill, it's understanding how, where, where the fractures are um, in, in the reservoirs uh, to some degree and how to drill and complete um, what are relatively complicated wells given the amount of salt. Um, uh, Brazil's probably got the best creaming curve in the world. Um, like even in the post-salt, which was pretty much um, everything that was going on in this part, you know, the post-salt plastics, it didn't look too bad. Recently, it's just taken off. And one could argue, you could say, oh, it's probably rolled over in the last year. I would say that is unfair on Brazil. And this has largely been driven by uh, the lack of new licensing rounds that there have been in the Santos and Campos uh, basins for the deep water, uh, which has resulted in more appraisal drilling than exploration drilling. And you've seen some exploration drilling in the Campos Basin, uh, not so much um, in the Santos Basin. Although I don't think we've added uh, the, the recent two wells, Libra and Franco, which are outside the current blocks um, in Brazil, um, uh, but haven't been added to this, uh, to this data set. Uh, those wells would potentially add um, a, another uh, probably billion barrels, maybe even a bit more um, of, uh, of risk reserves. Uh, Brazil thinks that the two together will easily give over five billion barrels um, of recoverable hydrocarbons. Um, the biggest, I think, trend in, in 2010 and 11, however, isn't so much going to be uh, in Brazil and the Santos Basin. There's going to be lots of news flow from that because the, there will be a repricing of the reserves in the pre-salt that will take place over the next few months as the government in Brazil will sell to Petrobras um, a set of assets um, that uh, are, have, have now had two wells drilled in them um, for a price 
which independent evaluators will come up with. We feel it's going to be at least $7 per barrel is what Petrobras will have to pay for these uh, reserves from the government, which will create a lot of activity um, in the marketplace as people decide to uh, revalue BG, Galp, Repsol's reserves um, in the pre-sold, uh, in, in the Santos Basin. On top of that, you're going to see a lot more drilling activity in the Campos Basin as well. But also, the, probably the most interesting from a deep water exploration point of view is going to be French Guiana, where there's a well going down in the fourth quarter, um, a Tolo Shell um, Total well, might uh, drift into next year. But this is an area that really hasn't seen much activity uh, at all. Um, uh, it's targeted historically um, structural traps. This time around, it'll be probably more stratigraphic traps. Um, echoing what's been going on in, in West Africa, but this is an area to look, uh, to look out for in the next 12 months. Now, qu quickly going through the other areas uh, that are going to be important. Um, uh, Indonesia is a, a place that a lot of people have written off because it's come out of OPEC, and, and most that aren't involved in the industry think that uh, uh, pretty much Indonesia is uh, completely done um, because it's been worked on for so long. However, there are two areas, uh, the Pascangaya area, Bone Bay around Sulawesi, and the West Papua area, which have never been explored before. Um, and these are two areas where a lot of drilling activity is going to take place over the next 24 months. Uh, Marathon have got two wells going down here uh, this year um, and plans to uh, take more data in, in Bone Bay and also drill a few wells in West Papua. Uh, Hess will be drilling in West Papua in 2011 uh, along with Marathon, along with Chevron and everybody else. So this is going to be an interesting area, probably more gas prone over towards the east, but there are indications of oil and gas um, over, in, uh, over in the west around Sulawesi. So this is going to be um, a, a, a potential new uh, big area for exploration. Um, uh, Libya, it, it's, it's worth mentioning it, not so much for the potential because there have been, I believe, two dry holes now drilled by ExxonMobil um, in the deep water area. Um, the only sort of real discovery that we've got any information on is Hess's discovery um, where it's starting to step out into the deeper water. It, it is very new. Um, uh, however, from a, 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 a company point of view, it, it's less relevant to most other areas in the world given the fiscal regime um, that uh, exists in Libya. Um, uh, so we, we tend to discount it from a share price movement point of view because it can add relatively limited value even if you find something large um, to a, a company because of the tax. Um, but it is something we're probably going to hear uh, more about, although Exxon have not been successful uh, so far from what we can, uh, from what we can tell. Um, then moving further uh, east um, again, um, I, I'm not going to mention the Philippines where Exxon have actually had some success. They've, they've gone through a bit of a bad run at the minute um, in terms of success uh, globally. In fact, it's probably the most unsuccessful exploration campaign I can remember, um, which uh, potentially could reverse this year, but it's, it, it has been, uh, they've been incredibly unlucky. Uh, but one trend which is starting to appear, and this is more, very much a gas condensate trend, is uh, in the South Chinese Sea. Um, around the Husky well, and Anadarko yet again are, are involved here, and uh, as are BG and, and others. But this area where Scenic are in too is going to be an area which, which again is, is drilled extensively in 2010 and 2011. Um, skipping on to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the Gulf of Mexico went through a, a great wave um, in, the, in the 1980s and really kicked off a lot of deep water exploration then. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the late 90s, there were quite a few really big discoveries, Thunder Horse being one of the best known um, of, of those. However, it started to drift a little bit um, as we went through, again, uh, the, the middle of the last decade. And it wasn't until a lot of the, the lower tertiary discoveries have been made um, in the last few years that it's taken back off again. It was actually doing very, very well in the last few years. Um, again, with things like BP's Tiber discovery uh, from last year, albeit something that probably won't come on production for quite some time, it was still heralded as a major, uh, major success. Um, Anadarko's Shenandoah uh, discovery as well was also seen uh, as being uh, very positive, as well as Buck, uh, Buckeye and a few others. Um, 
However, the spill has uh, changed all of that. So if you take a step back, um, and this is not to make any sort of environmental statement, but I just wanted to bring things in context. What we're seeing today in the Gulf of Mexico um, is uh, a, a, a spill of such proportions that it has uh, basically walked all over uh, the safety record that was in place in the Gulf of Mexico, which wasn't perfect by any means, but it's brought the world's attention um, onto the activity of, of deep water drilling. If you look at the top, this is basically data from the MMS, so you know, official data uh, from um, uh, the US. Um, these are numbers of instances of fires uh, and explosions. And in the black, these are blowout, numbers of blowouts that have happened in the Gulf of Mexico uh, since 1996. So you can see that there's been a reasonable amount. Why have we not really heard about them? Well, we haven't heard about them because in many cases the blowout preventers worked um, and we didn't have a situation like we've got today. Indeed, when you look at oil spills, there have been you know, a few years where you've seen oil, reasonable sized oil spills. When you, you put it in a, a, a sort of North Sea perspective, like getting like 13,000 barrels of oil spilled in a particular year is not very good at all. But that, that really pales compared to what you're seeing today. You know, if you take the official um, uh, production or spill numbers from BP, you know, an annual, 2005's annual spill was surpassed in three days by the current spill that's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. So the world's attention is on here, and it's being taken in the media and by the politicians as this is a complete unique event and, and something that needs to be, a lot of attention needs to be spent on. You could argue that a lot of attention should have been spent on things since 1996 because it's not exactly like the industry has been squeaky clean. Uh, but of course, you turn a blind eye to it until you get something catastrophic that, that's happening today. This was all uh, sort of pushed underneath the carpet when in March, um, Obama um, and Salazar came in and said, actually, we do need to drill for hydrocarbons in America because if we don't drill for hydrocarbons, we're basically helping out OPEC and uh, various nasty governments that don't like us very much. So this was their plan as of April. And I've tried to show here what is changed um, over the last few weeks uh, because of the spill. So areas that are off limits, um, there's basically only one, which is, and this is Alaska, sorry, not to scale before anybody says anything, but it's, it, it's, it's like Hawaii. Hawaii's always stuck down here, and it doesn't la uh, uh, live off Baja, California, uh, but it's the only way to show it on one chart. Um, in Alaska, the areas off limits are Bristol Bay. Um, that was the only place officially off limits um, in, in the US, but in blue, uh, what you've seen here is basically areas where there was no local support to do any drilling, and this is very much the case in California, where there's plenty of oil prospects offshore uh, and discoveries which have never been developed. Um, but areas, again, with no local support, same in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, right close to the shore, and same up around uh, the North Atlantic. But what was interesting was you did see these yellow areas, which are areas where the USGS and the MMS decided that they needed to collect more and more geological, geophysical information to see what's actually out there. In fact, on top of the, the, the current drilling uh, lease sales in the Gulf of Mexico, also in the Cook Inlet, they also were planning to do one off Virginia. In the weeks following the spill, the public consultations on Virginia has been postponed. So it looks very much like that isn't going to happen um, anymore, and this was sort of seen as being a 2012 uh, sort of lease sale. Additionally, it looks very unlikely that the eastern Gulf of Mexico lease sale is going to go ahead at all. If we look over to the Arctic in the Buford Sea and Chukchi Sea area, again, these are areas that Shell are trying to drill uh, this year, but they will not get a permit. Uh, we'll find out, to, uh, what is today, 26th? We'll find out um, on the 28th. Uh, whether they're going to actually get a permit uh, to drill uh, there at all. So effectively, what we're saying as a result of this spill, it looks like new wildcat exploration in the Chukchi Sea. There's a, I think I stole this from you, David. Yeah, a long time ago. It hasn't changed, although you're very old. It hasn't changed very much. The plates haven't moved that much. 
Um, anyway, uh, we, uh, we, we think that this whole area isn't going to see any activity until 2012 and beyond. Uh, what is going ahead, and we know that rigs have been deployed already and people have been uh, deployed to go out on the rigs, is uh, Cairns drilling in West Greenland. That does not seem to have been affected uh, yet. So this is, these are wells that will go ahead this year. This area, um, we think 2012, uh, may, might be the earliest before you see new activity there, although Shell will try and drill uh, this year if they, if, if they can. What does it mean from a global point of view? Um, now, to me, th th this is one of the more important things to look at, that these, this is a production profile from fields which have not started up yet, but will start up this year and going forward, uh, from fields that have been discovered and have got either feed <coughs> development plans or have gone through sanction um, in terms of developing uh, them. Uh, so uh, there have been discoveries that have been made which we have not included here um, because they haven't gone through the, the feed engineering uh, stage yet. So when you look at this uh, from the deep water, and this is over a thousand meters, like four and a half million barrels a day of oil production um, by 2018. So this is a sizable chunk of new production uh, for the planet. So any trends to change regulation could affect this production uh, profile because th this production profile is completely under risk, essentially in the US at the minute, but depending on what happens in Brazil and in other areas, if we see increased regulation coming in from governments globally, this could get pushed. Just to show you what that could um, uh, be uh, like what, in terms of the implications and, and to end on this slide. Um, if we delayed everything that was meant to start up from 2013 by a year because of increased drilling parameters, maybe uh, people looking back at all the drilling plans, and this is only delaying it by a year, the black line is what we predict world supply uh, doing over that time, uh, OPEC and uh, non-OPEC. Um, the gaps that start opening up are if you start delay delaying these deep water projects. And the gaps are getting up for half a million to a million barrels of oil a day. Um, that is effectively going to have to be closed by OPEC. And by 2017, that means absolutely no OPEC spare capacity would be in existence um, uh, across the world, maybe even sooner than that. What does this mean for the oil price? Well, I think you all know that any delays on new production coming on, any new regulation is just going to drive up the, the, the oil price. And we think that what we're seeing here is um, a, a really a, a, a sort of self-fulfilling uh, prophecy in, in a way that this higher oil price could actually generate uh, much more exploration opportunities going forward, although those exploration opportunities themselves are likely to be delayed quite heavily uh, because of regulation that's likely to sweep in from the US, but also globally when you actually start thinking about the fact that most of the rigs working in the US will have to comply to new safety standards, which means everywhere else in the world you're going to have to pay for those safety standards if you want to drill in the US or outside the US. So, David, I will... Um, Leave it with that. And did you want to take questions? Yeah, that's, uh, thank, thank, you. thank you for that. Um, any, we've got time for uh, five, five or ten minutes of questions if we want. So, um, anybody got anything to ask? And don't be shy. Or otherwise, I will. Oh. Please, yeah. Hi, you. Uh, sorry, Ed Reed, Newspace. Um, you were talking about the subsalt off Brazil, and there's been some discussion of the subsalt off West Africa. What sort of prospects do you, uh, do, do you, do you see there? Yeah, the, it, it's a, a presentation I gave, I think, oh, January, yeah. February um, here, uh, where we looked at, at that. Um, and there is some prospectivity in the south of Angola um, for the, for the pre-salt. Um, there are, are wells that are meant to be drilled this year and sort of next year, Maersk, uh, Petrobras, and Cobalt, um, over the next uh, 12 months are all going to be drilling, um, uh, presumably with, with, with pre-salt um, targets. I, I think from a geology point of view, 
the only similarities it's really got to Brazil is the fact that it is pre-salt, like there's a layer of salt there. Um, but actually, from a, 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 a reservoir point of view, there's probably quite different reservoirs. Um, and there's also a question mark over the, the source rock in, in terms of does it have the same maturity characteristics, does it have the same uh, TOC uh, characteristics in, in that particular area. But the fact is, not a lot, of, well, nobody's drilled pre salt before in that area, largely because to actually get below the pre salt, you have to drill extremely deep wells. And nobody's drilled that far south, really, targeting pre-salt targets. So it, it, it's a huge unknown. But there will be at least three wells in the next 18 months that will be drilled there. That will give some indications if there's a working hydrocarbon system uh, below the salt. It is The analogy is more with the Campos Basin than the Santos Basin, just because the thickness of the, of, of the salt is, uh, is, is, looks more Campos-like than, than Santos-like. And then Namibia is the next one where you know Chariot and, and um, Petrobras are going to be uh, drilling there at some point over the next 18 months as well. OK, anybody else? Yeah, please. Uh, we just wait for the microphone. Uh, have you got viewing the uh, latest trend in uh, Black Sea Basin, as you see today? Yeah, the, the, we haven't included the Black Sea on this um, because there's been uh, quite a lot of recent activity in terms of Exxon Mobil again being one of the, the big ones uh, that's gone into it. So they're still in the, in my mind, more the evaluation stage rather than the drilling stage. So we could actually see a, it may take another year before they've, they've actually got a lot of drilling plans in that particular basin. Although it is an area where most of the offshore and the potential areas in the offshore and offshore. Uh, Ukraine as well now, rather than just the southern portion of the Black Sea is starting to uh, take off. Uh, if you look at the Black Sea in terms of what's been drilled so far, and if you go right to the east of the, the, the Black Sea, uh, it's been pretty awful in, in terms of very expensive wells, and there just hasn't been um, a, a hydrocarbon system in place. And the reservoir, the reservoir targets, from what we can tell from some of the wells that I think BP drilled two wells. The, the, the reservoir targets were um, very poor quality, um, uh, very shaly um, uh, sort of st uh, clastic uh, targets that, that wouldn't uh, go down well for making good reservoirs, even if there was hydrocarbons there. So it's one I've left off because I think it's a bit more on the evaluation stage. But you are right. A lot of people are getting interested in that. Um, and it'll probably need two or three rigs to be in place for everybody to, to drill like five to 10 wells back to back while the rigs are there um, before you actually get a good sense of, of what's happening. But I think you're talking more 18 months away uh, than anything more, uh, more recent than, uh, than that. OK, there was somebody else waving. Keith. Hi Neil, just wanted uh, Keith Myers, Rich, Richmond Energy. Just wanted to go back to the uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, uh, spill, and I think what shocked me was, wasn't so much that the accident, because accidents do happen, uh, tragic and terrible that, that it was. But it, what shocked me really was just how unprepared the industry is in terms of containing an event like that, and that the only way that we really Proven way is to drill a relief well, and that can take three, three months. And you've seen the, the at five thousand or whatever the rate, the oil was spilling out. It's a hell of a lot of oil. Um, and and uh, thinking about the wider implications here, thinking about developments in you know deep water exploration in, in Ghana, uh, Sierra Leone. I mean, you read the Tello, uh, the the EIA for Jubilee, for example, and. It talks about flying equipment out from Southampton. I mean, there is obviously there is no oil spill response capability, or very rudimentary. So, have we been very complacent as an industry with regard to? Yes, we've got the technology to drill these wells, but we actually haven't got the t haven't in parallel developed the, the technology to deal with accidents. Um, I, I think the only answer is yes. You know, and it's pretty obvious today that. The industry has been complacent, but 
I think you show me an industry that you know actually does risk assessments on everything. That I don't know what uh, there's still big question marks over mobile phone handsets. Like, have we done enough studies to see if they're going to be bad for us or not? Who knows? Um, I think if you look at the oil industry, you know th this is one thing that's obviously it's, it's going to advance the handling of um, of spills at uh, at five thousand foot water depths. Um, I've got a bigger issue, which is what are, what do you do at ten thousand foot water depths? Um, you know, if you're having problems at five, you know, it's much greater issues at uh, ten. Um, but nobody seems to be wanting to worry about that yet. But you could throw things out like LNG tankers. Like if there was a terrorist attack on an LNG tanker, nobody actually knows what's going to happen. I don't know if we've all seen the film Syriana. And there they had an ending where they were pretty clear about what should happen with an LNG tanker if somebody blew it up. Not at all clear. Um, I've suggested to one major integrated oil company that they should take an old ship out into the middle of the Pacific and blow it up to see what happens. Fill it with LNG. Because at least then, people would know what actually happens. Like, does it all vaporize off or does it actually go bang in a really big way? So, you know, like what do you do? Do you do that on everything? Do we have a well before we drill to 11,000 feet or 12,000 feet? Like, do we spend two years to do a deep water operation to make sure we can handle the spill? All of it means that if you continue to do all of that, um, you have to tell the consumers that the price of energy is going to be substantially higher, which will mean you have to start saying to people, we need loads of new nuclear plants, which means, and it just, you know, it, I think it's one of these things that the more and more studies we do, and we delay getting on and after exploration and all sorts of, 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 of energy, uh, the more the prices are going to go up, um, since demand isn't going to go away. And the, the, the problem here is to do it in a measured sense, where you take something like we've got today at 5,000 foot, and you start planning, well, does this cover everything out to 10 and 11,000 feet? And you make BP effectively write up everything it's done so that Ghana has got a blueprint of exactly what to do if it ever happened in Ghana, which I hope it never does, or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So I, I think that's probably where it's going to go rather than every time we go another 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet, we take you know, a two-year breather uh, to work it out because the two-year breather is actually going to increase the energy prices globally for a lot of people who, uh, who don't really want to be affected by higher energy prices. And unfortunately, that is what you have to weigh up with environmental disasters. But I, I think you, the, the, this corny phrase, lessons learned, uh, which I'm sure some great management consultant came up with, um, I, to me, if I was in the US administration, I would make BP very much write up the blueprint of what to do in this event and make sure that everybody is running with that as a standard and then actually, uh, um, uh, in parallel to our drilling activities that go on today, give money to uh, the, the whatever is going to follow from the MMS to say, is this applicable to 10,000 foot water depths so that there's a constant research program going on as well as drilling additional oil wells. But to hold up exploration for multiple years to test if it makes sense is just going to massively increase energy costs. Do you think it's going to shift the sort of company? I mean, you were talking, you know, for the last four or five years that the majors have not really been exploring. Whereas if you're if you're, uh, I don't know, sitting in Greenland or Port Stanley in the Falkland Isles, you're thinking, well, the ultimate backstop is that the oil company owns the resource and pays for the cleanup. I mean, if you're a five billion market cap company faced with a 10 billion cleanup bill, that's extinction, isn't it? Yeah. I so, so you're really pushing back towards the Exxon Shell, <coughs> Chevrons. BPs as the only people who've got the pockets, basically. Uh, or, is that right? Or? Well, or the other way to it is that you, the government's mandate that you have to be insured. I think that that is potentially coming as well. But mm. this whole, I love the word self-insurance. Um, it, it sort of gives you that feeling that there is insurance around, but then when you really think about the words, it means that there is no insurance. <laughs> you pay for it yourself. So all the major oil companies are self-insured, and most E&P companies have got some level of an, an, an insurance provision. 
I know ourselves from what some of the things we've been looking into, like insurance costs have gone up in the last month, um, uh, as you would expect. But I, I, I would think that in a lot of places now, um, you have to be able to demonstrate that you've got a, a, a huge amount of insurance to cover this in, in, in the deep water, and that is going to be an issue from some of the, the smaller companies. Although, given the cost of some of these wells that are 100, 200 million dollars uh, a well, if you're in that sort of game anyway, like raising a few million dollars for insurance on top of that isn't going to stop you drilling the well. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, it just means that energy costs are going to go up because you've just increased the marginal cost of supply, we think, at least by 10% from the drilling costs and the, and the extra compliance that take place. If you increase by insurance as well, you could be talking an extra 15 or 20% on top of what it would cost to develop a deep water field from the, from the exploration phase. Okay. Okay, thank you, Neil.